teen movies, which focus on the lives of adolescents, often deal with themes of rebellion, friendship, love, and rites of passage. They explore what it means to be on the cusp of adulthood. The teen film dates back to the 1950s, with films like The Wild One, Rebel Without a Cause, and Blackboard Jungle. Although not strictly teen films, Rebel Without a Cause and Blackboard Jungle proved that teenagers were a lucrative market. A 1959 issue of Life magazine noted the following. American teenagers have emerged as a big-time consumer in the U.S. economy. They are multiplying in numbers. They spend more and have more spent on them. And they have a minds of their own about what they want. Hollywood responded with a handful of successful teen films over the years, such as Jailhouse Rock, Gidget, Beach Blanket Bingo, and American Graffiti to name a few. The 1980s saw a renaissance in the teen movie genre. In Timothy Shray's book, Teen Movies, American Youth on Screen, he ties the resurgence of teen movies in the 80s to the development of shopping malls across the United States. With the relocation of most movie theaters into or near shopping malls in the 80s, the need to cater to the young audiences who frequented those malls became apparent to Hollywood, and those audiences formed the first generation of multiplex moviegoers. For the American teenager, daily life was a battleground. Their parents pushed them around or ignored them, their teachers were bored and disinteresting, and they were confused with sex and even more so about love. Class and money transitioned into the chief issue seemingly pursuing every American teenager's life, high school cliques, and one's ability to break free of their constraints in order to discover who one really is. And this was the central idea to most teen movies at the time, especially John Hughes movies. No matter how difficult these issues were, they were always resolved in the end. No problem was unmanageable, no adversity insurmountable. The movie's redemptive arc guaranteed that the rich guy and the poor girl, and vice versa, could set their conflicts aside, and the result was a new, more perfect union. And while these films are influential in their own right, no 80s teen movie will ever compare to Heather's. I just killed my best friend. And your worst enemy. When Daniel Waters initially wrote the script for Heathers, he had Stanley Kubrick in mind as a director, not only out of admiration for him, but he thought that Kubrick was the only one who could get away with the three-hour movie. That's right, the original draft for Heathers was meant to be three hours long. After a number of failed attempts to get the script to Kubrick, Waters approached director Michael Lehman, who, prior to directing, supervised camera work on The Outsiders back in 1983. Heathers was Lehman's directorial debut, Producer Denise DeNovi also got involved. The script made it to many production studios, but there's one problem. Many of them declined it, stating that was simply unfilmable, given the subject matter of the movie. Hell, this movie wouldn't even get greenlit today either. Eventually, the script landed on the desk of independent film studio New World Pictures, who had a few successful films in their catalog. They agreed to finance the film on one condition, that the original ending be changed. The issues about the ending and what happens were never a problem for me or Denise DeNovi or Dan or anybody else. They were a problem for the studio making the movie. And speaking of which, there was not just one, but two alternate endings to the movie. The original script ended with JD blowing up everyone in the school, and there was a prom in heaven with the drain cleaner as a punch bowl and Martha Dunstock singing. The other alternate ending involved Martha screaming, fuck you, Heather, and charging at Veronica with the knife. And Veronica falls to the floor, laughing with the knife in her stomach, saying, I'm not Heather. The film was impossible to cast, as not a lot of people wanted to be in it, as they saw it as damaging to their careers. Jennifer Connelly and Justine Bateman were approached to be cast as Veronica Sawyer, but they turned the role down. Winona Ryder auditioned for the role, but Daniel Waters didn't find her attractive enough for the part, so she got a makeover and she got the part. Waters stated that in the initial draft for Heathers, Veronica was like a female Travis Bickle, but rewriting with Winona in mind, Veronica became more of an audience surrogate. It was a great... I had actually just gone through something where a girl had committed suicide who was, uh, you know, called everything from a freak, a witch, a, you know, just a girl who dressed differently and who was, um, 
kind of goth, and she committed suicide in my school. And, and then as soon as she committed suicide, everybody was talking about how great she was and saying that they were friends, and her funeral was huge. And it was like, and then I got the script, and uh, you know, it just really struck me because I was so disgusted with the behavior of my school. Writer's manager was quite reluctant about her taking the role and begged her not to take it, worrying that it would destroy her career. As for the role of JD, there weren't that many people auditioning for him. One of these guys auditioning for the role was Brad Pitt, but despite thinking he wouldn't get it, Christian Slater landed the role of JD. Heather Graham was approached for the role of Heather Chandler, but she turned it down. So Christian Slater's then girlfriend, Kim Walker, got the role of Heather Chandler. Graham got the role of Heather McNamara, but her mother refused to let her take the role, and it went to Lee San Falk instead. Shannon Dotery wanted the part of Veronica, but of course, Ryder was already cast, so she read the part of Heather Duke, which she ended up getting. Filming took a little over a month, 33 days to be exact, on a budget of $3 million, but shooting was not without its problems. Christian Slater overslept and missed shots, and Shannon Dotery was, in Daniel Waters' words, a bit of a handful on set. She had an objection to the profanity in the script and refused to say the more explicit lines. When the movie was being screened for the first time, Shant Dotery ran out in tears because the movie was a comedy and not a drama as she was expecting. Just as Heathers was set to be released, New World had run out of money, meaning they didn't have a lot of money for marketing. As a result, the movie ended up breaking in only a million dollars at the box office on a budget of three million, making Heathers a box office bomb. Despite its box office failure, the movie was well received by critics and has gained a cult following on home video and has even gained a musical and a TV adaptation, which we don't talk about, years later. Teenagers are famous as a perpetually depressed generation. No matter where we look in time, there is always a story with an angst-ridden teenager as a subject. Heathers takes the feelings almost all of us experience while in high school and amplifies them to almost psychotic proportions, but this is why the film is so appealing. It's a classic because it's a scathing look at teenage life, and its deep cynicism serves to highlight the value of sincere kindness. Screenwriter Daniel Waters bitterly and hilariously uses satire to exaggerate the dramas of teenage life, including sexuality, eating disorders, self-esteem issues, social status, and drug use. While intertwining each of these aspects of teen life, the central subject of Heather's is teenage suicide. This somewhat controversial film seems not to look down upon teen suicide, but in actuality, the film is an expert work of sarcastic satire against suicide. I don't really like my friends. Yeah, I, uh, I don't really like your friends either. Main characters Veronica and JD are two teenagers, both deeply cynical and profoundly thoughtful, who are placed in a contrastingly dull Midwestern setting. Veronica is part of the most popular clique in Westerberg High, run by the Heathers, Heather Chandler, Heather Duke, and Heather McNamara. Veronica is essentially dying to get out of it. One day, she meets Jason Dean, or JD for short. Beneath JD's allure lies something rather sinister. In the beginning of the film, Veronica quotes Heather Chandler by saying, Real life sucks losers dry. If you want to fuck with the eagles, you have to learn to fly. The irony here is that as mature as Heather Chandler may come off as, she is still a teenager who has not yet experienced anything close to what real life actually is. This type of speak makes her inherent suicide even more believable. In most societies, people are pressured to conform to a standard. All of the Heather's peers perceive the Heather's and Veronica as four pretty girls who dress well, go to parties, have the full attention of men, and are the envy of women. None of the students realize that Veronica is a stronger person than all of the Heathers combined. Visibly, Heather Chandler is viewed as the strongest, yet the reason for that perception is subjective. If a person's definition of strong means snapping at people, playing cruel pranks, and performing fellatio on random frat boys, then Heather Chandler is a strong person. Veronica's statement to Chandler sums up the true feelings of how Heather's peers feel about her. Does it not bother you that everybody in this school thinks that you're a piranha? Like I give a shit. They all want me as a friend or a fuck. I'm worshipped Westerberg, and I'm only a junior. When Heather Chandler goes down on a frat boy, she is conforming to the rules of being cool. 
The scene of Heather Chandler rinsing out her mouth after pleasing the frat boy shows how much of a victim of society Heather was, whereas when a frat boy tried to make passes at Veronica, she set him straight. You know, I have a little prepared speech I tell my suitor when he wants more than I'd like to give him. You see the speeches from Malcolm X. I just want to get laid. You don't deserve my fucking speech. When JD gives Heather Chandler a hangover cure of pipe drainer, Veronica thinks it was an accident and helps him stage the murder to look like a suicide. The note left by JD and Veronica talks about the myriad of mistakes Heather's made in her life. I die knowing no one knew the real me. This line in the note is interesting simply because when we see Heather Chandler, it's almost easy to tell she is dissatisfied with her life. This is also an explanation as to why she comes off as cruel and unsympathetic. When the school sensationalizes her death, the true meaning behind the filmmaker's intentions is seen. The embellished way the kids and teachers of Westerberg react is shocking to see. People seem like they're so sad to hear of such a tragedy, but when they're shown praying by her body at the funeral, everyone's mind is in a different place. Just about everyone either had something inappropriate on their mind or felt joy that Heather was actually dead. Jesus God in heaven, why'd you have to kill such hot snatch? It's a joke, man. Jeez, people are so serious. I prayed for the death of Heather Chandler many times. And I felt bad every time I did it, but I kept doing it anyway. Now I know you understood everything. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. The various responses to suicide is when Heather's is at its most cynical. Heather Duke, who herself has been bullied by Heather Chandler, goes to every news station she can approach to give an interview about how devastated she is. Similarly, the school paper capitalizes on Heather's death because teen suicide is currently a national issue, complete with the cheesy public awareness song. The next set of victims on the list is the school's senior football stars, Kurt and Ram. When they die, they're set up by JD and Veronica to be lovers who made a suicide pact. The film hints at the wider social implications of this through the way it portrays homophobia. And here's the one perfecto thing I picked up. Mineral water. Oh, come on. A lot of people drink mineral water. It's come a long way. Yeah, but this is Ohio. I mean, if you don't have a brewski in your hand, you might as well be wearing a dress. The bodies of Kurt and Ram, themselves virulent homophobes, are discovered by two boorish cops who say with disgust, Oh man, they were fags. At the funeral, Kurt's dad famously remarks, My son's a homosexual, and I love him. I love my dead gay son. To which JD snidely declares, how do you think he'd react to his son that had a limp wrist with a pulse? To which Veronica laughs, recognizing the truth of JD's words and the hypocrisy of society. But then she stops as cursed little sister turns to see the pair snickering. The cynical tone of the film clashes with the gravity of its subject matter and forces the audience to gradually distance themselves from the allure of JD, coming around to Veronica's increasingly mature outlook. That thing this afternoon? I'm so angry, it was chaos, fucking chaos. I mean, today was great. Chaos was great. Chaos is what killed the dinosaurs, darling. Kurt and Ram's deaths are also sensationalized by the school. When a place makes death something to be gossiped about, it takes away from the person who has died. This was the message the filmmakers were trying to bring to the public's attention. One element that really stands out is when Martha Dunstock, or dump truck as the score refers to her, sees all of the suicides occurring at the school and decides to try it herself, even though no one has actually killed themselves and everyone that has died up until this point was considered popular, while she was the one actually being teased. Martha ends up being injured, but she doesn't die. Heather Duke says her suicide attempt was, another case of a geek trying to imitate the popular people of the school and failing miserably. This is a perfect example of how media in actual society would react if something like this happened. The media determine what goes on the wavelengths for the world to see and what doesn't. When Martha tried to kill herself, there wasn't a single person in school talking about it. This goes to show how people react to deaths of people who are popular and people who are deemed unfit to be popular. At the start of the third act, 
Veronica has a dream in which she finds herself at Heather Duke's funeral, doing the same thing she's been doing at the countless funerals she had been to in recent past. The priest doing the service says, Your fellow teenagers can be cruel, parents can be unresponsive, and as she writes so eloquently in her suicide note, life can suck! Because this is a dream, the filmmakers were able to use a public figure, the priest, to project teenagers' view of the world. Heather Duke killed herself because the world was an awful place and no one understood her. This is classic teenage angst, which, despite how it feels at the time, eventually dissipates and we all get to participate in real life. JD goes to Veronica's house to kill her, but finds her hanging from a noose. Thinking she's dead, he tells her his plan to blow up the entire school. Earlier in the film, JD told Heather Duke the petition was going to be for Big Fun to play a show at the prom. Unbeknownst to her and the entire student body, they were unwittingly signing a death waiver. JD plans to blow up the school and make it look like one big suicide. The next day, JD plants several bombs in pseudo-plain sight under some very exposed bleachers. Veronica confronts JD downstairs in the boiler room, where he plants the main bomb that will bring down the entire school during the weekly prep rally. Veronica manages to wrestle the gun from JD, and she shoots off his middle finger to the world. She makes JD turn off the timer to the bomb, which he eventually does, with four seconds left to spare. The four seconds, of course, representing the four suicides that occurred at his hand, his own included. The reason why JD is killing everyone in the school was because nobody actually loved him, which may seem narcissistic on its own because on the surface, it seems like he's looking for attention. However, it's actually revealed that his mother was killed in an explosion that his own father caused. As a matter of fact, his father has quite a few loose screws in his head himself. He came home with the video cassette of a bombing he caused earlier in the film, and JD watches in admiration. As JD learned from his parents, destruction is the answer. JD ends his life with one last bomb strapped to his body and blows himself up. The movie ends with Veronica inviting Martha over for a movie night at her place. It should be noted that Veronica's act of kindness is not in the offer, but in giving Martha the opportunity to speak for herself. Throughout the film, Martha is a passive figure, the targets of the Heather's pranks and a pawn in JD's scheming. Martha's attempt at suicide is therefore an attempt at wrestling autonomy back from her peers. But in responding to Veronica's honest and simple request, Martha is able to be in control without having to resort to self-destruction. The issue of teenage suicide is not what the core of Heather's is about. The movie is an analysis of humanity, from the way people treat each other to how people react in situations. The movie shows that in life, there will always be some kind of social structure. Adults have their own social hierarchy, as do teenagers. When teenagers become adults, they will still have a social hierarchy. Humans seem to need a social hierarchy to survive. It's survival of the fittest, which is what life is all about. By using intelligent humor, Heather slickly conveys its points about human behavior. As JD puts it, People are going to look at the ashes of Westerberg and say, Now there is a school that self-destructed not because society didn't care, but because the school was society. Looking at it from an outside perspective, Heather's is about Veronica realizing she's not cut out to be in the popular crowd. She's built to get along with everyone. The movie ends with the feeling that everything is going to be okay now, now that Heather Chandler is dead, now that JD is dead. The entire school is able to return to the way things were as opposed to living their lives in fear. Teenage suicide.